Hello, my dear Fingsters, and uh, welcome to another episode. Actually, this is our first episode in this new series on smart contract examples. Today, we'll go through an example of uh, a voting process. It's a very simple contract. It has uh, only several functions, and uh, it will demonstrate how to simulate a voting process by using a smart contract. Uh, before we start with uh, going through the code, I'd like to show you something uh, specific because I I want to clear this up uh, to to have in mind everything else that we're doing with the code, of course. Uh, if you focus your attention on this part of the screen next to this uh, deploy button, that's actually the input argument for our smart contract. And uh, you can see that uh, our input argument is of uh, type bytes32 array. This means that uh, we will uh, instantiate our smart contract by providing it with, uh, with an array of uh, bytes32 data. Uh, this bytes32 data is actually each name uh, of our uh, fictional users encoded into bytes32. Uh, to be more clear, uh, I have listed four fictional names, Alice, Betty, Cecilia, and Dana uh, here on the left side. And uh, here we have each of these names encoded into bytes32. So these are individual names and our contract input argument is here as an array. So it's each of these bytes32 uh, data in double quotes separated by a comma and put into an array. So that's this row here. Uh, you don't have to wor worry about uh, about having this uh, data. It's already in the appendix in the article uh, just before the conclusion paragraph uh, section. Sorry, just before the conclusion section. So you will be also able to just take this uh, this input argument for your contract when uh, you will be uh, testing this code yourself and you'll just put it in and uh, try how it works. Uh, there is one more uh, column in here. Uh, this column represents uh, my accounts, my testing accounts. So as you can see, uh, my first test account is I reserved it for the chairperson and it starts with a 5B3 like uh, here on the left side right here and it ends with EDDC4 that's this one here uh, Alice's account starts with AB8 uh, so in just a minute, I have to check something because. Aha, sorry. Sorry, I got confused for a moment. So, Alice's account is here. It's AB8. And it finishes with 35CB2. Uh, Okay, and then for Betty, it starts with uh, 4B2 and ends with ends with uh, CO2DB, just as the one here. And so the last two ones, and I'll just focus on the last one for uh, Dana, uh, finishes with 5 E7F2, that's in this one, mister, and uh, it starts with 617, right here. Okay, so 
now uh, we're clear that uh, this 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 and this account are the first five accounts on my list so when you'll be trying this exercise yourself you will have the same uh, bytes 32 encoded names but your uh, your accounts will very probably differ from mine okay so uh, we can go through the code as always uh, our smart contract uh, defines the range of uh, compiler versions that can uh, compile this uh, smart contract uh, the next thing is of course keyword uh, contract i will go a little bit faster because uh, there is at least one video sometimes before when we went through through our first very simple example so i won't uh, hang on every specific detail we have our contract definition here we define uh, the data structure for vote voter it has uh, uh, the weight uh, flag of voted I'll use my keyboard to, to prevent these pop-ups. Uh, it has the address if it delegated, uh, if, uh, if a voter delegated its voting right to someone else. If it didn't, uh, here uh, the value of this uh, delegate address will be zero. And finally, uh, this is the index of the voted proposal. Uh, so these indices will be formed in uh, in in the in the same order that uh, the proposal names and their appropriate accounts are listed. So in the order of appearance, as they would say in movies, uh, the first one is Alice, the second one is Betty. Then we have Cecilia and finally Dana. That's the order of uh, or the index of the vo voted proposals. Okay. Uh, the next data structure is the one for proposal. We have only two uh, uh, data members. The first one is of bytes 32. That's uh, exactly this encoded name for each of our uh, candidates. And the second one is vote count. This this vote count will increase if uh, each time when someone gives its vote to uh, to to this uh, to this specific member. Okay, so each time someone votes for a specific member, this vote count uh, variable will increase. Then we have a public variable of type address chairperson this chairperson will get uh, populated as soon as we deploy our contract so i'll do this right away to show you what i'm talking about i'll just copy this uh, contract input argument i remind you you have it uh, in the article in the appendix uh, currently i have no deployed contracts and this is an important step we have to position ourselves on the chairperson's account. It's 5B3 ending with EDDC4. That's this one here. And we'll give uh, the contract input argument and just click deploy. And our contract is deployed at uh, this address in memory. It's a D78. It will be something different when you try it yourself. F771B in my case. Okay, so now I have available this chairperson address and I can confirm that uh, the smart contract deployed by taking this specific account to be my chairperson. This is what I wanted and I wrote it uh, here. I already prepared this data. Uh, to to make it easier for me to follow uh, who is my chairperson and who are the voters and uh, finally who will win. Okay. Uh, so 
the next thing is uh, we have defined this uh, mapping and this mapping actually represents our voters with uh, each of them uh, having its address mapped to a voter okay i mentioned in the article and uh, i will uh, remind you of this very important thing once we initialize our mapping as we did right here so that's uh, like our dictionary it would be called dictionary in some other languages like python or java but here it's called mapping when a mapping gets uh, initialized it's initialized for all possible uh, addresses and uh, once we once we uh, vote from a specific address as i'll show you in a moment uh, this address will already exist in our mapping and it will contain uh, the data on our voter so it will contain the weight uh, flag if it already voted uh, the address if our voter delegated his uh, voting right to someone else and uh, uh, the index of the voted proposal okay so uh, the next thing is a array of proposals it's uh, empty right now but it will get filled as uh, the constructor executes so constructor takes our bice32 array of proposal names uh, as we passed this array right here during the deploy uh, next we have uh, the chairperson chairperson assigned to message sender since we uh, sent this message for a contract instantiation from this account that's our uh, chairperson once again when i click on it we will get uh, the information about the chairperson and that's exactly this account uh, we initiate we initialized our contract uh next uh we have our chairperson uh voting weight set to one so our chairperson also has a right to vote uh, the next thing is this loop where uh, for each of the proposal names by 32 encoded uh, we take each of these names and we are uh, adding each of these names to to our proposals array uh, this loop will uh, have four iterations and uh, once uh, it finishes our proposals array will contain all four uh, candidates uh, available to vote for them uh, the next function we have is give right to vote it uh, takes a voter address and it has one very important uh, restriction and the restriction says that uh, only the chairperson can give someone his right to vote so if this message sender is uh, different from the chairperson which would be if i did something like this if i took another account this one is specifically belonging to alice and if i tried uh, giving the right to vote i'll do this right now for instance i'll use alice and try to give right to vote uh, to betty we got an error because uh, as this uh, required clause defined only the chairperson can give a right to vote but now if i switch back to to the chairperson and start giving voting rights to each of our uh, 
to each of our actually I'll I'll do something else. I'll I'll take an entirely different account, maybe one from below. I'll copy it and I'll put it right here. So I'll take I'll uh, give a right to vote to some uh, random account and when I click give right to vote. Ah, sorry. When I was copying it, uh, I was I, I stayed on this account. I actually had to switch back to to the chair person. Always take care of that when you're uh, working with a contract. You have to to switch back to the chair person if you're working with some very specific operations that only a chair person is allowed to do. Okay. Now I'll click give right to vote and uh, now it's okay. We actually just given right to vote to our uh, to our contract right here. I'll also do one more thing just for my reminder. Right to vote given to. Now I'll put this one. We already did that one and uh, this one and then this one and finally I'll take one more voter, this one. So just as a reminder, I'm reminding you that when we initialized our uh, mapping, uh, all the addresses are virtually initialized with it. So whenever uh, an account votes for uh, for a certain candidate for a certain uh, proposal, uh, its key already exists in the dictionary, and uh, all this uh, data about the voter will just uh, uh, be set because uh, as i just did with the first one with uh, i'm sorry for the scrolling for this one when uh, i pressed when i called actually uh, the function give right to vote uh, its data got populated as i'll show you right now You can see that its weight is set to zero. Uh, maybe I miss. Uh, sorry, sorry. This is the one we need. Zero D, zero D. Aha! This was the first one I gave. I gave the voting right. So when I click here, we can see that. Uh, it has a right to vote. It didn't vote yet. Uh, it didn't delegate uh, its voting right to someone else. And finally, uh, this uh, voter didn't vote for anyone. So its default uh, default candidate or proposal to vote for is zero. Okay, let's just give the voting right to the remaining uh, three candidates, uh, sorry, not candidates, but voters, uh, like this one. And uh, I'll immediately check if you got it voting right. And uh, yes, it did. Then I'll do the same. I'll first check this one doesn't have a voting right. and. When we give him a voting right and check once again, uh, his weight switched to one. So it's like this person has one vote. Uh, a delegate will have several votes. It will have as much votes as uh, it, uh, as much times it got delegated to vote for uh, someone else's name in someone else's name, sorry. And finally, this one. Also give this voter a right to vote and check. And yes, 
each voter has a right to vote. So we went through this function, uh, give right to vote. Actually, I showed you how it works and uh, just let me show you until the end how it works. So if, if a voter already voted for someone, it cannot be given a right to vote. And uh, before a voter gets a voting right, its voting right, it shouldn't already have a right to vote. So it cannot be given a right to vote twice. If I try doing that, an error will come out. So that's because of this uh, this requirement that a voter should already uh, shouldn't already have a right to vote. Okay. Uh, now let's let's play with this function delegate. It also takes uh, one uh, argument. Uh, this will be the address of someone who is delegating his voting right to to someone else. Uh, we have this uh, reference to to a specific uh, voter. It's called sender. Uh, the requirements are also that uh, this voter hasn't already voted and of course it cannot self-delegate uh, a voting right. It has to be to someone else. Uh, this part of the code takes care of a situation where, uh, where, for instance, let me show you what could happen. If this voter delegated his voting right to this one, this one delegated his voting right to this one, this one delegated his voting right to this one, and finally, if this one would try to delegate his voting right to the first one, who also already delegated his, if we had this kind of a delegation chain, then this uh, this uh, where is it? Aha! This condition, this requirement, wouldn't be satisfied, and uh, this function would terminate. However, if we had uh delegation from this one to this one from this one to this one and then from this one to this one but this voter didn't delegate his voting right to anyone so he is holding his voting right and the previous three ones and then he would satisfy this uh, let me just find it he would satisfy uh he wouldn't actually satisfy this condition and this uh, this while loop actually works like a scanner it, f it tries to find a voter that uh, didn't delegate his uh, his voting right to anyone else and uh, once once uh, this loop manages to find someone as i uh, showed you a moment before if it manages, when it manages to find someone who didn't delegate his voting right to anyone else, then this uh, loop will end. And this uh, sender, the original sender, will uh, be marked as it already voted because it it essentially did. It voted his voting right to, to another voter. This is important because we don't want this... Uh, this voter to also delegate his vote and uh, vote himself. So once he delegated his voting right, it it lost. It. He lost it. And finally, uh, the delegate he delegated his voting right is set to two. Uh, when uh, we were iterating through this loop, <clears throat> uh, let me just pull back. Assume this scenario, this one already delegated, this one already delegated, and they both delegated to this one. And now this one is uh, it's his turn and he decided to delegate and he tried to delegate to this one. But since 
this one, uh, this voter delegated his vote here. Uh, the loop I was just showing you uh, will take uh, his wish. He want, uh, This voter wanted to delegate here. It will take this attempt of delegation and transfer it all the way here because this uh, voter is the only one who didn't uh, delegate his vote. So what the loop actually does, it, uh, it uh, takes every voter, it checks if uh, his uh, delegate uh, can uh, vote or his delegate also uh, vote, uh, delegated to someone else. Uh, I'm sorry for the complexity of this sentence. I'll try uh, in a simpler term. If <clears throat> So what the loop does, if uh, this voter delegated here and this one previously delegated here, the loop will just take uh, the loop will just uh, take this uh, voter and switch his delegate to here, to the only one who can actually vote in his name. Okay, we survived that part. <clears throat> and finally, uh, this uh, voter storage delegate line, actually, uh, this is a reference to, to this uh, final real delegate who is able to vote. And if this delegate already voted, uh, this part of the code will just take uh, take into account uh, this uh, this uh, proposal that delegate voted for, and it will just uh, transfer this one extra vote each time this delegate uh, delegation function delegate function uh, gets executed. And if if uh, the delegate still didn't vote it will just uh, take uh, this one extra vote and uh, it will add it to, to uh, its own weight. So uh, just a reminder, what is uh, the use of uh, weight on uh, its, each voter? The weight <clears throat> actually increases each time you get delegated from someone else. So initially, uh, the chairperson will give you one right of vote. And uh, if you get three more uh, uh, delegations, then you will have four votes in total. Okay. Okay, we did this part. And uh, finally, the function vote. The previous function was uh, just for delegation and uh, the function for voting is here. It takes uh, the proposal index, that's uh, the data, this, uh, sorry, not this one, but uh, this one. So it will take it will take the index of a vote. Uh, let me show you how how we can do this. Uh, for instance, if we if we switch back to to let's say this voter and uh, give. Uh, give our vote to proposal number one. I'm reminding you that uh, that uh, we start with the zero when we are uh, enumerating. So in our case, this will be one vote for Betty. Alice had uh, index zero and Betty has index one. So now when we press vote, we just gave one one uh, vote to Betty. If we try to vote one more time, we will get an error because 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 <clears throat> uh, this requirement. 
So our weight dropped to zero and also we already voted. So either one of these two uh, would uh, prevent us to, to vote for uh, Betty or any other candidate. And uh, here, uh, for the second time, I mean, because for the first time when we uh, voted for uh, Betty, uh, our weight wa was uh, one. So it was actually uh, different than zero. So we passed this requirement and we also passed this requirement because we haven't already voted. But now when we vote, our uh, voted flag will be set to true. And uh, this vote will carry the index of the candidate of the proposal we voted for. And if you're asking yourself why we have different uh, than zero and not equal to one, this is because a delegate has more than one vote and it uh, it will transfer all, he, all the votes he holds to, to a certain proposal, to a certain candidate. So if it has more than one, uh, we have to cover uh, all the conditions that are larger than one and also one. So this is larger than zero or in other terms, different than zero. So to vote, a uh, voter has to have uh, a weight different than zero. Or in other words, it, it has to have uh, more votes uh, on himself uh, than zero or at least one. And finally, uh, when we vote, when we vote, we have this uh, uh, proposals array, uh, the index and vote count. So if we had only one vote, we will increase, for instance, uh, in our specific case, uh, Betty's vote count for one or if we were a delegate that uh, had more than one uh, more than one vote on himself then we would increase uh, betty's uh, vote count by so many votes that we carried and uh, we're getting near to the end uh, here we have a function winning proposal <clears throat> that's public anyone can execute it uh, here we have a winning vote count set to zero and now we are actually going through all the proposals. We can do that at any given moment and uh, actually count and see uh, what is the index of a proposal that has the most votes. So to do that, I'll click, uh, I'll click this winning proposal and we'll see that the answer is one. However, if we take uh, this voter, so that's uh, DD8. DD8 is, uh, here, or maybe I'll take these two this one so five eight three i'm already here and i will vote for uh, two and that's cecilia and i press vote oh i did something wrong that's the one i already used okay then i messed up i'm sorry uh four b zero it's also useful for you to see my errors to to remind you not to do them yourself. OK, so now that we switch to to the voter for B0, we should be able to uh, to vote for uh, for this. For this uh, proposal, let me just see if it has a right to vote. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. However, 
let's just vote. All right, and uh, 147 will be our next voter. 147 is this one. And now when we press vote for Cecilia 2, <clears throat> uh, there should be two votes for Cecilia and one vote for Betty. And now when we press this winning proposal, instead of uh, Betty, we would uh, have to see number two, and that's Cecilia's. And Cecilia it is. Okay. And finally, uh, what this last function does, it actually just uh, gives us the name of the winning proposal and that it won't be a name in a readable form because uh, we are using bytes32 formatted names. However, when we press winner name, we're getting four three six da, 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 da. i won't read it all the way to the end but i'll show you i'll show you where it is it's cecilia so cecilia is a uh, winner of uh, of our uh, ballot of our uh, voting procedure uh, I see on my clock uh, this video took 36 minutes. I apologize for uh, making it so long. I tried to explain everything that uh, uh, came to my mind as uh, important. I also invite you to check out the article. It has uh, everything I said and more. Uh, it uh, has two main parts. The first part is just the source code without any comments, uh, without uh, any additional information except for the source code. Uh, I put it there because I found it easier when I'm uh, trying to figure out how a certain part of the code works to see it in a context of, uh, of other code. But uh, when I'm uh, focusing on uh, one part of the code, then I go to, to this uh, other section where the code is dissected and analyzed and explained uh, practically line by line. So these are the main two sections in the, in the article and they have each uh, their own purpose to help you understand and actually to take the code and paste it in the editor. And uh, in, for with the first section and uh, for the second section uh, is there to help you follow uh, what each line does. Okay, I'll conclude with uh, with this. Uh, thank you for your very much appreciated attention, and uh, I'm looking forward to have you in the next episode. Until then, bye.